I've been wood turning for a couple of years when one of the elder statesmen in the club I belong to walked up to me, looked at the cheap plastic pen I was writing with, shook his head, reached into his pocket and pulled out this beautiful pen that he had made. He took it, put it in my pocket and said, every wood turner needs their own handmade pen and he sent me on my way. Well, I've been turning wood pens ever since then and I've probably turned three or four hundred. But when it came to turning that very first pen, I looked at an aisle like this in a store and I was really intimidated and confused because there are literally hundreds of different types of pen kits that you can make. But the neat thing is, is that to make a pen, you only need a few simple things. Joining us today is pen kit expert, Greg Heppard. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Tim. When did you first start turning pens? It was about four years ago when I became the manager of the store here. I took a class and I was hooked. Really? And it was the first thing you actually turned, a pen? It, it was. I branched out into some other bowls, but pen, pen turning is still the basics. Now looking at this table, there are a lot of things you have laid out here, but I understand really there's only one thing other than a lathe that you absolutely have to have to be able to turn a pin. That's true, and that's the mandrel. And this is actually what holds the wood on the lathe while you turn it. Correct, and these are actually bushings that are left on here that come with this product. They're the standard seven millimeter bushing. Now seven millimeter is an important number because it is basically the smallest size that you, all these kits are based off of, right? That's right, Tim. This is the basic seven millimeter kit right here. There are several colors of kits. There's gold, there's silver, there's black titanium. There are actually right. different colored kits, blue, red, green. And this is a great kit to start with because it's simple, it's very inexpensive. You make any mistakes, you can waste five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of those and not really hurt yourself. They're really pretty inexpensive. And in addition to having lots and lots of kits you can choose from, Boy, you have a variety of woods and different materials you can use to make a pen, too. What's that one there? This is a man-made product. It's a, a plastic resin. Well, that's pretty neat. And then yellow heart? Yeah, this one's a yellow heart. Uh, a little bit of imagination actually helps out. Uh, this was turned by one of the guys here at the store. Yeah, that's a 30-06 shell and deer antler. And inlay turquoise? That's right. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for helping us figure out some of the You're ins welcome. and outs of making a pen kit. And let's get back to the shop and start turning. Now, the first thing you want to do when working with a pen kit is to get organized. I always get a Ziploc bag. I put my instructions and all the different parts of the pen kit inside. You don't want to lose anything. And since I also make a lot of different types of pen kits, this helps me keep everything separated. Well, the pen we're going to be making today is a very elegant one. Rather than twisting or clicking it to be able to write with it, this one comes apart in two pieces, kind of executive looking, and then you can push the top on for storage. Now where do you start when you're making a pin like this? Well, you start with a blank of wood. You have to make sure the blank is long enough and wide enough for your project. The other thing is, you want to make sure that the piece of wood doesn't have any cracks or checks in it or knot holes, because that will really affect the way the pin looks. Now the first thing we have to do is we have to grab the bushings that make up the pin. And these line the pin just like this, and the bushings or what you build and base the whole pin off of. All the parts press fit into the brass tubes. Now I want to lay this out on what I think is the best looking part of the wood. Leave a little excess on the end. It'll make a mark right here. And that's a little bit longer too. You got the extra wood here, you might as well use it. Same thing, I'm going to measure out this brass tube and mark it right here. Now the most important mark you can make of this whole thing is this line right here because when we cut this apart we're going to lose these lines and by making this mark we'll be able to match up our grain and they'll make the pin look really nice. And another thing to consider if you're like me and you want to make a bunch of pins at one time make sure that you mark these blanks one one and the next ones two two that way you keep the pairs matched and together. Let's go to the bandsaw. <laughs> You can tell by my lines I'm not that worried about being very accurate, but I do want to make this cut fairly straight. That way I won't waste very much wood when I match the grain. Make our next cut. And don't throw this away, you might find a use for it later. Now that these are cut to length, I have to drill holes to receive the brass tubes and those holes need to be perfectly straight. So I have a pin clamp here. It's a really cool device that as you squeeze it in on the blank, it comes in from both sides. 
So once you have this centered on your drill press, you can drill blank after blank after blank without having to reposition this. Really neat. With the vise centered, I'm going to put my blank in, and here's the mark I made. So this is where my grain match is. I want to drill from this end, not from this end, because as the drill bit comes through the bottom, it'll break out the bottom of the wood, and if I chipped away too much of the grain and was drilling with this end down, we wouldn't have a very good match. We'd lose too much wood. So I'm going to turn it on angle, tighten it up, and see it clamps, and it's nice and centered. Now I have my drill set at a slow speed, about 500 RPM. I don't want it to be too fast because it'll burn the wood and the heat could crack it. So I want to pulse this in while I'm drilling. And that also helps minimize the heat. Now our next step, we want to glue the brass tubes inside of the blanks. Well, the brass tubes are pretty slick, so I'm taking some 80 grit sandpaper and I'm just scuffing up the surface because that'll give the glue something to grab onto on the brass. Now you can use a lot of different glues to put these together, making sure I have the right hole there, but I like to use polyurethane because it expands and that way I'll get a really good grip and good contact all the way through the brass and on the wood. Just roll the blank and get a nice coating on there. You don't want to use too little glue, but you don't use too much either. Now normally with polyurethane, you'd use water to help activate it, but if I put water into this blank, the blank is so dry that it would immediately swell up and I wouldn't be able to get the tube in. And as it is, this tube's going to fit pretty tight. Now I'm twisting it as I go in so I get a good coating all the way across that blank. Take another stick and push that in flush. Now, this takes about four hours to dry, so I've gone ahead and prepared two other blanks, and we're going to turn these on the lathe. You can see the foaming right here. That's what I was talking about with polyurethane. That's really cool, and that's how you get that good contact. This seems like a lot of steps to go through to make a pin, but to make a perfect pin, preparation is the most important thing. We have one last thing to do, and that's to clean up the ends of both blanks. Then we can get started turning. If you're using a sanding station like I am, Make sure you have a perfect right angle from the table to the sanding disc and from your guide to the sanding disc and that will make sure that your ends are perfectly flush. And this doesn't take long, just lightly touch the wood, work it back and forth and once you see shiny brass, you've gone far enough. That's what you want to achieve. And you just start working on the other ends and finish up the blanks. Okay, now it's time to turn. When we were talking to Greg earlier, he mentioned that a pin mandrel is the most important thing you can have when making a pin because without it you can't make one. It holds all the components together so you can turn the blanks. We start with the bushings. They slide on like so. You take your blank and it fits onto the bushing. And then there's another bushing which comes in and see they fit inside the tubes. We slide another one on and here's the top of our pin and make sure you have those lines matched up so you've got your grain match going on. And you bring the other bushing up. And so that holds that on there. And then we take a nut, put that on there and tighten it down. And that keeps everything tight on the shaft. Now we want to keep this on the lathe because it's a morse taper and can fall out. Well they designed it with an indentation on the end of the rod. You take your tailstock and bring it up and with a nice sharp point, it goes dead center in there and it centers everything up. Now to rough this out, we're going to use a small flat spindle gouge. It's easier to use small tools when you're turning a pin. You have more control over them than a large tool. And I want to make sure my tool rest is lined up perfectly with the mandrel and that way I'll get a nice straight line. Now if you notice, my life center is not turning. That's because I haven't engaged it yet. I want to touch it to the rod, now it's turning, and I'm going to lock it down. If I tighten that too tight, it could bend the rod and affect the shape of the pin. And we'll just rough this out. One thing to keep in mind with your pin kit, make sure that you buy the kit and the bushings from the same source, because different manufacturers have slightly different specifications. They all might call a pin by the same name, like cigar pin, 
but their bushings and their mandrels might be slightly different than another company. Now I just want to get the blanks rounded out. I don't want to go any further than that. And just like roughing a big piece of wood, you still have to move your body to make the cuts work. Work my way from both sides. And then once it's round, I can go from end to end. Now bird's eye maple is actually, it's a beautiful wood, but it's actually kind of a risky wood to try to make a pin out of because the bird's eyes in it sometimes have cracks around them. And if they do, you can just fill that with a little bit of sawdust and no one will notice. Let's see if we're about rounded out there. There, that looks good. Now we have to start shaping the pin. This is the top, this is the bottom where your hand's gonna be gripping it. And we wanna bring down these edges to the diameter of the bushings. That's the size of the pieces that push in and make the pin top and the pin ends. So we'll just start making nice gentle shapes. This is so small, I wanna pick up the speed a bit. That'll help me with my cuts. You know, pins are a wonderful project to make. People always ask me questions about what type of wood is that on the pins I have? And they make great gifts. And they really are good for developing your skills on small things. And I'm working my way down in increments to each end because I want to keep my shape flowing. If I just worked on one end and try to bring it down to the bushing, I might wind up with a lopsided looking shape and I want this to be symmetrical. The other thing is keep in mind, do you like to hold a fat pin or a thin pin? That also will fit into your, uh, figure into your design idea. Now I'm very close there. I'm probably, oh geez, I don't even know if I can measure that but I can feel it with my fingernail. There's barely a bump on either end. That's as much wood as I want to take off on this end because I can sand that flush. Now that's the bottom of the pin. This is the top part. You can see the bushings are larger, but I'll go ahead and complement this shape on this blank. And it'll come out very nice, I think. This again is almost like making a bead. You want to sneak up on it a little bit at a time. I don't want to start right back here and plow my way into the bead. I want to gradually work the curve and work my way back. Because if I plow my way in from back here, I'll start tearing out the grain. It's getting really close. One last pass. Okay. Now, we're ready to sand. And normally, you see me fold my paper into threes like that. Well, I still want to do threes, but I want to go vertically and make it long and skinny. We don't want our fingers to touch the wood as we sand because that could affect the shape of it. And by making this long and skinny, whoops, with the sandpaper, don't forget, protect yourself with breathing protection. There we go. Move this out of the way. Anyway, if my fingers aren't pressing on the wood, I can get a better shape to the wood. I'll show you what I mean. Got to lower the speed here. Now we're going to take our sandpaper and we're going to suspend it like this and let it follow the curve. Now, if I had my fingers up here and I'd be pushing, my finger could actually cause an indentation on the wood. So we just move back and forth. And I just gently work it into where the bushing meets the wood from both ends. And it doesn't take long with maple. See, that's flush already. Make sure you keep this moving because the wood is extremely thin at this point. If you build up any heat, it's gonna crack. Now it's time to put a finish on the pin, and since this is going to be used a lot, I'm going to put tongue oil on, so 
it'll give a nice durable finish. Now I want to hand rub it in first to let it soak into the wood really well. And I'm going to be generous with it. Okay, now that's in there good. We're going to turn the lathe on, increase the speed up from where we had it when we were sanding, and we're going to use the friction provided by the lathe and the paper to dry this on the lathe. You still have to be careful about heat, but we do need enough to dry this. Let's see how that looks. Oh, doesn't that bird's eye just pop out? Now let me get the other side. Get it dried in there, there we go. Now I could apply a wax finish on here to really shine it up, but I like the matte finish and the wax finish after a few days of use would go away anyway. So got that stopped. Move our tailstock back and take this off the lathe. Now make sure that you keep the orientation of the blanks the way they are because when you press this together in a second you want your grain pattern to still match. There are a lot of pieces to this kit and it might look confusing but that's why we have the instructions. They really help out and when you look at a finish pin it starts to make sense. The first thing we want to do is to press this piece in and we're going to use a pin press to put it together. It's a really neat system completely adjustable so you can put different size pin parts on there. There's this little stem of wood that you can remove but it holds the piece so you don't need three hands to do this. And we gently press in and it pushes it nice and tight and flush. Now the next part. Line this piece up. There, good tight fit. Now we get to put a couple of things together. And if you don't have a pin press, uh, you can use your drill press to start pressing these parts together. Or you can even use your lathe as a pin, pin press. It'll help you put some things together. There. Now we have the bottom half already finished. Let's start working on the top half. Now for the center ring. That's nice. Now we're ready for the last piece and that's the clip and I just want to position it to where it complements the wood grain the best. I'll remove this little dowel rod and press this together. There we go. And it made a really nice pin. Something fit for maybe even my boss. Well we got a little bit of time left I want to make something for myself. So we're going to make a shop pencil and we're going to use a man-made material. I already went ahead and cut this to length. And when you're drilling plastic, make sure that your drill bit's moving at a very slow speed. And I'm going to have to bring in some compressed air here and cool off the bit and the blank as I go down. Because this really won't crack, but it will melt. Another thing that you have to be very careful about is that when you drill through the bottom of this, it's going to break. It's going to chip out. So make sure that you cut your blank about a quarter inch longer than you need it. Now this pencil kit is a little bit simpler. It only involves one tube. And I want to use a different glue. Since this is a man-made plastic material, I want to use cyanoacrylate glue because it actually melts into plastic. So I'm going to put a good coat on the tube. I want enough to make contact the whole length of the tube when I put this in. I'm going to work a little bit quick, quickly, slide that in, I'm going to move it in, bring it out, that coats the rest of the tube. Now, I don't want to get the glue on my fingers, so a good trick is take the glue bottle cap and use it to press the tube in there, and you won't get any glue on your fingers. Now, once this sets up, I'm going to clean the ends with a pin mandrel. Now, this has a seven millimeter shaft on it, so when it fits in this hole, it's going to rattle. So I took a seven millimeter piece of brass, put a piece of wood on it, and actually turned a pin, which is just the right size to fit in there and that'll keep me straight. Glue's dried, let's work on the end now. I'm gonna press up, I'm holding this with pliers so it won't spin in my hands. 
And I'm using the cutter system because it cuts rather than going to my sander, which sands and builds up more heat. And that would possibly melt the plastic. And there, see we have shiny brass. That's what we need to do on both ends. I've got the blank and I've mounted it on the mandrel with the bushings. The only problem I have is I have too much pin mandrel left over. Well, mine's adjustable, so I'll just come up here, loosen that, and slide it in till the threaded rod is inside a little bit. Tighten that back down. And now I can put my knob on and it will tighten down. Now, if you don't have an adjustable pin mandrel, you can actually add extra bushings to fill up the space in the gap. Now, the jury is a little bit out on what speed to use when you're turning a composite because they're all different densities. Some of them are really tough and others like this one are fairly soft. So if you have too much speed going, engage my tail stock there, you could melt the plastic as you're cutting. Now you rough this out just like you would wood and start working your way back. Cuts nicely. Now if you notice, we have chips coming off. As we start getting down to where it's rounder, we'll start making longer and longer shavings. Now you might be wondering why I picked red. Well, my shop gets pretty messy sometimes, so I want something I could find easily. So if I drop it on the floor, red should show up pretty well, I think. <laughs> Now I'm going to make a long pass across and you're going to start seeing those long shavings. You can see how those can kind of be a bit of a hassle while you're turning because they like to wrap around everything you're doing and you can't see the end then. And the best thing I can say is just try to use your tool to move them out of the way. If you push really hard with the bevel of your tool, you will start melting this. So if that happens to you, slow the lathe down and ease up on the pressure that you're putting on there. Now I want my transition to the bushing to be pretty close to that size because this is not an easy thing to sand quickly. I want to start with 220 and I just want to take the marks out. I don't want to do any shaping. Feel that with my fingernail. Got a little bit more to go on that and we'll be there. looks good. Now I want to move to the other end, do the same thing to it, and when we're done shaping, I'm going to show you a special sanding technique that will really bring out the beauty of this material. Now I've sanded all the way down to 600 grit, and that looks pretty good, but I want to take some diamond paper and sand all the way up to 4,000. It'll really make a beautiful surface. Okay, here's our last grit, 4,000. And you see it's getting a beautiful shine right now. But I want to take it even a notch higher than that. And we're going to apply some plastic polish. So we're going to speed the lathe way up and apply the polish and buff it in. And now watch this thing pop out. Use a dry spot on the cloth. That is cool. Now let's put this pencil together. Screw this in here. You push the in and the lead comes out for the pencil. Pretty neat. Oh, we made a pretty nice pen and pencil today, but we've only started to scratch the surface on things you can make with a pen mandrel. You can make perfume atomizers, letter openers, even light pull chains. There's a whole lot of different kits out there, so just take a look, see what you want to start with and make. Well, until the next time on the Wood Turning Workshop,